before we have the presentation, I just wish to acknowledge that uh, I live in the unceded ancestral and traditional territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. And I know that uh, many of you are living in different areas. Um, and today, uh, Nancy uh, Langton, is, uh, who has spoken with us a number of times, is going to talk to us about her experiences in Myanmar, uh, they used to be called Burma. So I'm going to hand it over to Nancy and have her share her screen. But I want to ask everyone who is on the call to please mute yourselves so we don't get feedback, which we often do, if you don't mute yourself. Later on, you'll have the opportunity to unmute and ask questions. But for now, while Nancy is presenting, please, everybody, mute yourselves. Uh, Nancy, can you share your screen, please? Okay. And I'm going to put it on speaker view. Okay. Okay, thank you, Paul. And thank um, all of you for coming here today and listening to this talk. As I sort of alluded to a couple of moments ago, um, this talk, might be more ambitious than it should have been. I took two trips to Myanmar, one in 2015 and one in 2016. And what I've done is combine those trips. Um, they were two very different trips. So the 2015 trip was highlights of um, Myanmar. Um, so that would be kind of the beaten track that people would often do if they went and visited there as tourists. And then in 2016, um, I did a trip that was actually called Tribes, Tribes of Burma, um, and that, that was a really off the beaten track. Um, some tourists have been there, but we were actually in some places that tourists haven't really um, been to at all. So I've put those together, and we'll start with the highlights uh, of Burma, and then um, we'll sort of go from there. So the trip started, um, this is Myanmar, up. I'll try to say Myanmar the most times. Um, the U.S. is one of the countries that does not acknowledge the word by Myanmar. I might mention that to you. Um, and so we started in um, Yangon on that first trip. And um, then we went to Mandalay. And then um, we went over to Inle Lake. Um, we, in the second trip, we... Um, started in Yangon, and there were two parts to that trip. One was the Naga Festival, which I'll tell you and then about. And the Naga Festival was basically up here where my pointer is, sort of in northeast Myanmar, touching very much on India. Uh, they have a sense of where we were and how we traveled. Um, and then we eventually got our way um, down to Sitwe. Um, did some traveling on the Bay of Bengal and ended up uh, again at Inlay Lake. And so I've saved all my photos for Inlay Lake um, to just the end of the presentation. So this was um, the Yangon. Um, we stayed at the Sedona Hotel and, um, and then you can see from the Sedona Hotel um, some, I mean, not a lot, obviously, but some of the downtown um, area of Yangon, and they were doing a lot of building at the time. Myanmar is in quite a lot of um, trouble, if you will, at the moment. Um, there had been a freely elected um, leader who's now imprisoned, and um, as, as I said in the little blurb to this presentation, the Canadian government recommends that one not travel there um, at the moment. So I was there at a very fortunate time, um, about two years, at, in 2016 when I was there, it was about a year and a half to two years after an election that had actually gone quite well. This was um, part of downtown um, Yangon. And um, I take these kinds of photos because I'm always amazed that um, we can go to these underdeveloped countries or less developed countries and find all of these beautiful vegetables. And I 
often wonder to myself, why can't I find these things at home? Um, and here they are in the streets. They're not even in the in a market, um, and they're beautifully arranged. And um, so I just think it's wonderful that these kinds of vegetables are available um, so well. This was at um, a pagoda, I won't be able to pronounce it very well, um, in Yangon called the Hayatagi Pagoda, um, which is near the Shwedagon Pagoda, which we'll see in a few moments. Um, and this was a very large Buddha statue. And I have two photos of that. So this is kind of a close up, if you will. The Buddha statue is 65 meters long. Um, and this is the full photo. It was really hard. This, this particular statue is renowned for having a very peaceful face, um, but there was no way to shoot it straight on. So this was the best I could do um, to capture it. I was quite fascinated um, by the inlay on the feet um, with all the different symbols here. This is Shwadagan Pagoda, um, and it dominates the skyline in Yangon, and it's the most sacred Buddhist temple um, in Myanmar. And so we were there sort of at um, nearing sunset or nearing the evening. And so it was actually quite crowded there, but I managed to take a photo at a moment where there was not a lot of chaos right around me. Um, and so that kind of gives you a sense of what that pagoda looked like. It was actually, it was quite beautiful. And so you've got the white um, buildings in the center, and then you've got these gold buildings on the sides. And, and so it's kind of a whole um, pagoda plaza. Okay, that's some um, highlight, <laughs> highlights of Yangon. We flew from Yangon, <coughs> excuse me, to Bagan. Um, and Bagan is an ancient city in the Mandalay region. Um, and it's home to um, the balloons. And you'll see those in a moment. And this is um, the Shui Sanda Pagoda. And it's five terraces um, going up. Um, and this is about the second and goes up. The fifth is somewhere up here. And you can actually, or the fifth is up here and you can actually go into the temple. It was, um, I have to say, it was frightening to climb this thing. Uh, this, it was very, the steps were very uneven. There, there was railings there. It wasn't particularly crowded um, the day that I was there. And there were about 10 of us in this tour group and several people didn't even attempt to do it. I managed to get to maybe midway to the fourth terrace and I just, I couldn't go any further. I was afraid of falling. Um, and that, that's just me. I think there were a couple of people in our group who did um, go higher. It's quite an impressive um, stairwell, as you can see. And these, um, these are kind of cloth pictures at the bottom and um, they were for sale and um, uh, available for, for people to purchase. This is um, just an overview of Bagan, and it's um, part of the land of the pagodas. And so you can see all of these um, pagodas around, and you can see a number of cows in the field there. It, it was really kind of interesting to see all of these pagodas and um, one of the interesting things is in some countries, pagodas are really in a way separate from the people. Um, but in Myanmar, many of the pagoda situations are right among where people are living. And so it um, just makes it easier uh, to navigate the situation. These are some of the balloons. We were um, in our hotel um, on the terrace having breakfast and, and balloons just started floating um, above us. And so I quickly um, took a shot of the balloons. We did not take a balloon ride. Um, I was told that a group um, in the, that the, our tour guide had taken the year before, there had been actually an accident in the balloons. And so that tour group, tour company didn't really want to offer us uh, balloon rides. This is uh, more balloons in the area over the field. Um, you can also see all the trash in the field. And it was quite a sight to see, it was, it was very early in the morning, um, to see all these balloons um, go off and, um, and, and, and then float in the sky as they were doing. 
this is still in Bagan. We went to a lacquerware factory, and this was reported to be a very well-known, very reputable lacquerware factory. And um, they told us if you were going to buy lacquerware, this is where you had to buy the lacquerware because there was so much fake lacquerware um, being sold. And at, at sort of another market that we were in, um, one of the women selling lacquerware overheard our guide say, um, you know, she's wrong that we're not selling fake lacquerware. So the woman was quite upset that our guide uh, implied that her lacquerware was fake. And so she wanted to show me that hers wasn't fake. And so she took a lighter and, and lit it to the lacquerware and apparently fake lacquerware bursts in flame and real lacquerware doesn't burst in flame. I don't know if this is true or not, but what I was thinking to myself, imagine the shock to tourists if you have to take out your lighter and perhaps set a whole market on fire to find out if you're looking at real lacquerware. So um, I don't know what to tell you about doing that. Anyway, um, we were able to see the whole process um, from the drawings going on in the inside and the outside and, and the painting going on in, inside. Um, and then the lacquering, some of that was going on in the outside. And this is, it, it, it smelled terrible. And these fumes are actually toxic, maybe not if you're just going through the factory for a little bit, for, but certainly for these employees, um, it's quite um, toxic. And so um, that really made me think of a lot of whether I really wanted to purchase any lacquerware um, given the dangers that the employees were going through to um, produce that. Oops. Okay, um, from Begon, we then went to Mandalay and um, Mandalay was kind of interesting in that um, it, it's part of the old part of um, Myanmar and the way that we got around some of uh, Mandalay was on uh, horses and carts, which, which was kind of fun. And so what you're seeing right here is Mandalay Hill, um, which is a major pilgrimage site for Burmese Buddhists. And so you kind of, you look across this lake and, and up and, and see all of these pagodas. Uh, we'll, we'll see another hill of pagodas in a little bit, um, but it was really quite impressive to see this. This was part of, in Mandalay, Kuthadao Pagoda. And one of the sites or importance, um, which I don't have a photo of, um, is that this particular um, pagoda has the uh, contains the world's largest book, um, which was about kind of five feet tall. It was in a glass case, and I'd say about three feet wide. And um, so that's what it's known for. It's um, I don't remember what the book was um, about, but anyway, we wandered around. The, the white of the stone was just really stunning um, in the sun, and. <laughs> Yeah, it was really, yeah. Um, like her mother. Thank you. I'm sorry, it was there a question? Okay, this was a little girl um, who was in um, the plaza at that um, temple and um, she was selling little um, kind of necklaces of flowers. Mm -hmm. And you can see that she has yellow leaves on her cheeks and, um, and what, what's, um, what's that for? The name of it is something like Thakir, and um, it's used as a sunscreen. And you see many women in Myanmar wearing that yellow on their cheeks to protect them um, from the sun. So she's, whoops, did we lose our... Sorry. Um, So it was kind of interesting. She's offering these and she's um, eating an apple at the same time. It's kind of cute. This was a little boy. This caught me partly because um, I've worked in labor relations um, as part of my career. And um, this was a little boy painting a side of uh, the pagoda there. And um, it's quite clearly child labor. I don't know what the child labor laws are in Myanmar. There probably aren't 
um, very many laws governing the principles. Um, but it just, it just struck me. Um, it's quite interesting. And he was really, he was on his own. There was nobody um, that I could see supervising him. And he finished that patch and, and moved um, the rug around and the bucket and moved to another section. So he had a sense of what he was supposed to do, but he looked quite young. This was again in Mandalay. This was uh, the Jade Market. Um, and so we went there one day to, to watch it. And it was really kind of fascinating. And there are a couple of photos here that you'll see um, of different parts of the jade market or, or different operations of the jade market. So these are some of the larger polished stones um, that were kind of being negotiated for. And what I noticed um, in, in the market was uh, the men were mostly the, the people who sold the large pieces of jade, both the polished and the unpolished jade. And so here are um, three sellers here. And then you also have a, a larger market, I'm sorry, you also have a larger market where um, you have these much smaller stones. And, um, it, and my observation was that it was the women who sold the smaller stones. Now, whether this was worked out in some logical way or there was some reason for it. Um, I, I think some of it might have to do with the use. So the smaller stones um, were definitely going to be used uh, for jewelry, um, where the larger stones would have um, a variety of other purposes. This was the um, Gino nunnery in Mandalay. And um, so that the green building that you see is the convent. And then um, you see there's an outdoor area and they have hung some clothes on, and they're sort of like a little storage area. And so we went up the stairs over here and into the convent and, and visited with the nuns there. And so these are um, some of the nuns that we visited with. The nun sitting here is Mother Superior. And so um, they had invited us to visit with them and they first uh, were eating lunch um, and we just watched them eating lunch and, and tried not to interfere, just watched from a distance. They fed us lunch afterwards, but we didn't eat with them, though they were around um, when we were eating. So they were eating their lunch, which was a vegetarian lunch. And um, then they sat um, in the front of the room. I don't know what's causing this skipping. I apologize for that. Um, sat uh, in the front of the room and they allowed us to ask them questions about their lives, uh, what their lives were like and um, how long they had been in um, the convent and things like that. And mostly Mother Superior answered the questions, but the young nuns also answered some of the questions. And so some of them said that they had um, started into the nunnery at about uh, in their mid-teens and had been there um, ever since. And we asked, did they ever leave? Did some ever leave? And there was some turnover um, where women decided that it wasn't really for them. The purpose of this uh, particular convent was that um, it provides education uh, for the young monks. And um, so they were mostly teachers um, there and they had their great books um, in front of them there. One of the things that they fed us was pickled green tea, something I wish I could find here. And I've, I've looked for recipes and sort of, sort of found recipes, I haven't really tried them out, but they pickle the tea leaves and make this salad out of it. And it's, it's, it's kind of tart, but it's an interesting taste. And you eat that with seeds and nuts and um, rice and things. And so that was something that I'd never had before. And, and um, I thought it was really delicious. This um, is, let's see, this Saigang Hill. Um, it's the religious center of Myanmar. Um, and on this, I mean, obviously I didn't capture it um, as this, but there are 600 pagodas and monasteries, 3,000 monks and nuns. So that's kind of the concentration of the religious area there. Okay. Um, this is also in Mandalay. And um, this, is the, this is the last part of my highlights of um, Myanmar. And this is Yubain Bridge, which is a 200 year old teak bridge that's about a, um, about a mile and a half long. 
And um, people walk across it because you get a good view of um, the area from the bridge. I didn't, I don't remember why I didn't go on the bridge. I know that I did not go on the bridge, but I know that some of my companions did. Um, I think I was just wandering around looking at the different things. You see all these boats um, lined up as well. It, it really fascinating looking bridge, I have to say. Okay, so this um, new section of this presentation is the part um, where my group is visiting tribes. And so um, we flew into Yangon from wherever. Uh, uh, so this is the next year, this is 2016, January, 2016. Um, so I flew from Vancouver into Yangon and then um, flew from Yangon to Homelin. And then we traveled by boat on the Tinwin River to Hatamanthi and then continued to Leshi. Um, and this trip took us something like 16 hours, um, some of the flight, but the driving um, in particular um, took quite a long time. Um, my notes say that um, it was, we only had to go, uh, no, sorry, I've got ahead of myself. Um, it, it took us uh, most of the day to get to this village that we were going to, which was Lushy. And um, before we started out, I took this photo because um, it really captured what the road was like. It was, it was a dirt road and it was lots of switchbacks. And I suffer car sickness, um, which is not a good thing. And um, so I often, which I'm really grateful for, um, the travel guides will often let me sit in the front seat, sort of, because otherwise I'm gonna to have to stop every 10 minutes while I get sick, which isn't gonna be helpful to anyone. Um, but we were out in the middle of nowhere and drove along there for five or six hours. And because of the switchbacks, you'd sometimes think you were gonna be there soon. And you certainly um, did not um, get there soon at all. So um, this area, as I mentioned, is in the far Northwest of Burma and it borders India and it's home to the Naga. Um, the Naga are a number of different tribes. Some of them live in Burma and some of them live in India. And I, if I recall correctly, there are about 45 of these different Naga tribes and they have different names. And we were, I'll show you a few of the tribe um, outfits. Uh, we were able to see about eight of the tribes. Um, this festival is held every um, January 15th. The last time it was at Leshi had been four years previous. And so it switches back um, from some areas of India into some areas of Myanmar. And it's meant for all of these people to get together and um, to celebrate um, their connectedness and also to pray for abundant crops and good health um, for their animals and good weather. So um, it's very unusual for foreigners to be able to come to this um, Naga festival. And so uh, our travel guide had to apply um, for us to see if we could even get in. And the government allowed in total 51 outsiders, foreigners, um, to attend this festival that particular year. And it was the first year that foreigners were allowed to um, attend the festival. So I guess they were trying to see how that would work out. And I know that uh, two years later, uh, the same travel people that I went with went back, uh, not to Leshy, but to another area. So that um, foreigners, they had decided to, to let foreigners on. But I will say that they did keep track of us. Um, quite a bit, although we weren't quite aware of that um, at the beginning. So this is actually the village of Leshy. And we stayed in a concrete building that had just been finished and was going to be, a, in the future, was intended to be a government building, and, but they had just finished it. And so they rented it out to us and had a number of rooms, had, it had no furniture of any kind. It was concrete, it was just concrete. Um, and our hosts had taken um, planks of wood, covered them in blankets and then gave us more blankets. And, um, and we slept on the floor. 
and uh, it was freezing cold. It was unbelievably cold. There was a, a bathroom and a bit of a shower, um, cold water. Um, in the evenings, what we would do is we would boil water outside and just, we didn't take the cold showers. It was so cold, you couldn't take the cold showers. Um, and, and so we would boil water outside and then we'd carry some hot water inside and just do kind of a warm sponge bath. Um, that was really um, the best that we could do. And, and I made notes somewhere that I've never been so cold in my life. I don't know if that's completely true, but I, I know that in, in, and I'm doing this now again to you all, um, none of my friends have agreed that they would ever go there again because I made it sound so terrible um, because I kept talking about the cold, but actually it was a, really a great um, <laughs> trip in many ways. And um, we got, so we would have stayed down in this area. And then these are different homes that you see here. And we actually, over the course, we stayed there about four days. Um, and over the course of those four days, we went and visited um, in a number of the houses. And you'll see a little bit of um, that in, in the next couple of photos that I showed you. But people would just um, let us in and um, we could, uh, talk to them. Our, our, we had a guide from Myanmar and he um, could interpret for us. And they was to tell us about um, their lives. They lived very uh, Spartan lives, I will say that. Um, but they were very welcoming to strangers in this. They didn't feed us, and nor were they expected to feed us. Um, but they welcomed us into their, our, their homes and they let us look around and they chatted with us and, and we're just friendly as could be. Nancy, before you proceed on, could you tell us how high this was located? What was the altitude that made it so cold? Uh, that's a good question, and I don't know the answer to that. It would, it would have been under 8,000 feet because we didn't have any altitude issues, but I would say it was 6,000. Okay, thank you. It, was, it, it happened to be... Um, unusually cold in Myanmar that particular year. So I had been in Myanmar the year before at around the same time, not up there. Um, and I was wearing shorts and t-shirts. <laughs> and so that's kind of how I packed for this trip. And um, I get there and it, everybody's wearing jackets and sweaters and are freezing to death. So it was just unusually cold. Um, that um, in 20, in January of 2016. So, so that also influenced um, what was going on for us. Good question though. Um, so this is a, a house, which is mostly one room. Uh, this is the grandfather, granddaughter. She's working on a fire and she's also boiling water. You might be able to see the tea kettle a little bit. Um, you can see that the fire is in the middle of the room and um, You'll see several uh, photos of guns. They, they really were proud of their guns and they would show us their guns. Uh, it's not clear what they did with their guns today, but in, in the past, and you'll see a little bit of this, um, uh, some were headhunters and some were uh, tiger hunters. And so that's the kinds of things that they um, used for their guns. Um, this particular man, his gun had come from his father um, and he also showed us a canister from his father and, and he was really proud to be sharing this um, information with us, these materials with us. This is just kind of a fun picture. So this little boy was standing outside of that particular home and holding this thing and I had no idea what that was. It looked handmade to me. So it turned out it's kind of a wagon. And um, so the kids would uh, get on the wagon and the back, the little child in the back, um, who was younger than this one, but the, he, the, this one was in charge of the little one. The younger one, this one would get off, sort of push it and jump back on. And then they rolled down a hill and they had a crash barrier um, at the end to stop them. <laughs> it was fun to watch. Okay. So um, we were walking through the village. We came across this house and, um, we first just saw just this woman was sitting outside the house and she started talking to us, obviously talking to our guide who then talked to us. And she said to us that she was feeling sick and her legs were sore and swollen is what she told us and asked if we had any medicine. So somebody in our group gave her some kind of um, 
salve to put on her legs. Um, we didn't know if it would help or not, but um, that's that was our contribution to this. And her husband came out and it turns out that her husband um, has hunted, I said, I said tigers, but I meant leopards, um, leopards. And um, he actually um, on his body, he tells us, has tattoos. You get particular tattoos if you've killed leopards. Um, and so that was the gun that he'd used to kill a leopard. And he was um, quite proud of that. And she was quite proud. They'd been married for quite a long time, but she was quite proud to be his husband, her, I'm sorry, his wife, um, because it's very magical to be the wife of the uh, leopard hunter. So um, we thought that was interesting. They spent quite a long time kind of chatting with us and um, he posed with his gun in different positions and things. Um, just in, you know, very much a rural lifestyle, um, if you will, very rural. Um, this particular photo, uh, we we're inside a building and these women uh, are pounding rice. Um, and so they're kind of grinding it. And so I just wanted to show you how that got done. <laughs> okay, so this was another part of the village. And there were actually several villages intertwined um, and like maybe a mile apart from each other, if that's so lots of walking um, between villages. And so this particular uh, man, he was a headhunter and he told us that he had killed three men. Um, he didn't tell us why he killed three men. Um, and he told us that the last one was in the 70s. So um, we, didn't, uh, we didn't ask him why he was killing people. He also was erratic. We ran into um, some of the different, and particularly the men that we ran into uh, were on opium, were using opium, and he was clearly on something. Um, and we didn't get too close, he didn't seem too dangerous, but I mean, we did sort of watch what was going on um, with him. I'm noticing a little bit that there are some things in the chat. I can't look at the chat. So if there's a question, please just blurt it out. I, I can tell you the question. The question is, uh, uh, why were they killing leopards? Were the leopards uh, threatening them or were they just for sport or what? Um, but I think some of it was, threatening, but it's also a, a badge of honor. The fact that you could kill one made you a very special person. That The fact that you did kill one um, made you a very special person in the village. Um, and as I kind of mentioned, but you know, the, the wife emphasized to us that she was very proud to have been able to uh, marry a leopard hunter because there aren't that many of them in the grand scheme of things. Okay, so um, this is at the um, Naga Festival, which um, was maybe about a mile from where we were staying. Was where this, I don't know if stadium was quite the right word, but big open area, big open field. And so this was um, one of the tribes. And each of the tribes wears different kinds of garb. Um, you know, they tended within their garb, they tend to dress mostly alike. And so these had the red sashes and the orange hats with the black plumes and then the white feathers. And this particular group was the group that actually um, opened the ceremonies. They carried in the um, festival pole, um, which marked the openings to the ceremony. And we had been in around them and kind of watching them and taking photos. And all of a sudden you could see all this action and all of a sudden this pole showed up and then they were off and, and we were actually in the middle of them accidentally and having to get out of their way. Um, but they didn't really, they didn't, I mean, they noticed that we were there and they didn't seem to mind that we were there. And as I said, it was quite unusual for foreigners to be there, but um, it all worked out, um, which was nice. Uh, this was another group. These were um, actually younger children. And um, there were both girls and boys in um, this particular unit. And they uh, were a musical unit. And, and you can see that they, um, were playing kind of a, a gong kind of thing. And, and again, you can see, so they're wearing these sashes that have um, this gong thing on it. They've got these sort of bows on their legs um, and they've got these plaid um, hats for the most part. And this was the leader of the group. And you can see that um, his hat is different than the others. Um, and so they were in an area and, and then people were watching from outside. 
Oops. So this is one, there were women and men together, most of particularly adult women and men were uh, in their own groups. So they might be from the same tribe, but they didn't enter together. Um, they entered separately. And um, the women were really just beautiful. And um, so they were standing here sort of um, posing for us for a little bit. And um, they, it's the kind of orange beads in this case that really ties them together because you can see that their skirts are um, a little bit different, their shoes are a little bit different, um, but they are all uh, from the same tribe. Okay, um, before we go on from there, um, one of the things I wanna say is that we stayed in that village for about four days. And as we were traveling to the village, um, actually even before we went up that long steep hill that you saw, we became aware that it was quite cold. And so we bought jackets um, because we didn't have um, fleece jackets of that sort for, with us. So we bought jackets in this one village. And then when we got to the place where we stayed, um, the first evening they were selling blankets and there were gonna be more people, more of the foreigners were gonna be coming into that village um, the next day. And so our, our tour leader suggested that we really consider buying uh, blankets because we were gonna be cold. So each of us bought a blanket. So then um, when this part of the trip was over, we didn't really need the blankets anymore. We, we felt we probably did need the jackets, but we didn't need the blankets anymore because we were gonna be staying in hotels after this. And so um, the morning that we were leaving, very early the morning we were leaving, we were to leave our blankets outside um, our, the doors of the buildings that we were staying in. And then our guide, uh, um, the, our travel leader and our, the guide, and I think one other person took these blankets and just delivered them to different people in the village um, who had led us into their houses. And, and they were so, we didn't see it, but we were told about it. Um, they were so grateful and to them, it was like Christmas and so unexpected. And for us, um, in a way it was nothing, like we didn't have anything to do with these blankets now. So it was really nice that we were able to get these blankets um, my jacket, I think I held on till the end of the trip and then I gave it um, to one of the drivers who was um, also grateful for that. So it, it's a good um, reminder um, to share when we can. Okay, so in this particular, um, so we so the Naga festival is now over. And so that was like one part of um, this, it was a two part trip. So everybody from the Naga festival was, was going on to the tribes of Burma trip, but not everybody from the tribes of Burma went on the Naga festival. So anyway, we grew, regrouped um, in Yangon and we had to get to um, Rock U. So that's spelled M-R-A-U-K. And then second word is just a U, Rock U. And where we, the reason we were going there was um, to see one of the first tribes that we were gonna see, which was um, Chin, C-H-I-N, women. And so to get there, we flew from Yangon to Thandwe, which took an hour. We flew from Thandwe to Sitwe, which took 40 minutes. We took a boat ride from Sitwe to Morocco which was about 45 miles away, um, but it took us five hours um, to, to do that um, 45 mile boat ride. Um, it, it was peaceful and calm, so um, that was really fine. And so what you are seeing here is um, Kuthong Temple, which is the largest Buddhist temple in Morocco. And the name means the temple of 90,000 Buddha, in, oh, sorry, I'm ahead of myself again. I'm sorry about that. Um, this is Morocco, um, and so just an overview of Morocco with that temple. Um, and then this is part of the village of Morocco. And so again, this is in someone's home. They let us um, take a photo of them in their home and they sit at these low tables um, on the floor and very Spartan houses. And you can see that it's, it's a bit warmer here um, where they are. Uh, in, in this village, I had a particular shock one of the days and I don't have this photo, but 
you can imagine it. So a mother and her child, probably about the same age as these two little boys or this little boy in particular, were standing outside and the little boy had shorts on and this really beautiful kind of scarf draped over him. And I love fabric and color. And I wanted to take a, a photo of this little boy with the colors of his shorts and his scarf and hanging over his shoulders, so kind of like a shawl. And so I motioned to the mother, could I take a photo? And she said, yes. And then, oh my God, she took the scarf, which is really the whole point of the photo, off of the child, then exposed his private parts and <laughs> expected me to take the photo. <laughs> Oh my God, I could be arrested for this at home. And um, it was, I, I didn't even know what to make of it. I mean, I was just in shock. I kind of pretended to take the picture because it's like, you can't, you don't want to like run away in horror because that wouldn't really be helpful. But um, anyway, uh, one of the experiences of traveling to these villages. Okay, this is um, Kuthan uh, Temple, uh, which is the temple of 90,000 Buddhas. And, um, they're just Buddha faces um, all over the place. And the temple was built between 1554 and 1556 by King Dika. It's quite, um, it was quite impressive to, to see all of this. It, I mean, it took a lot of work to build that, I have to say. Um, this was just uh, on the river. And, and this is a man who's actually um, washing himself. I had some other photos of him coming down the hill, but I thought, for privacy's sake, I would just show this photo. So he had filled the water and then he's just pouring it over himself. And they were doing um, public bathing, although not, not public in the sense, I've been to some places where everybody's bathing at the same time in the rivers, but this is more an individual effort. These um, tin cans, whatever you want to, containers, um, everybody had those, they were really cool. And our guide, our, our travel, person uh, who lives in Maryland, um, he bought one of these from one of the women who had it, um, asked if he could buy hers. And, and she's like, you know, you can just go to the store and buy a brand new one. And he was saying, no, I want one of these that have been all beat up. And she was looking at him like he was crazy. And um, I, they settled on a price, which she thought was like ridiculously a lot of money. Um, but she was willing to take it and give him the, the jar. But I think she's still wondering who are those people and what were they doing and why are they buying this old tin? So one of those things. This was on the river, just one of the scenes um, that we saw as we were traveling in the Chin area. I should say that the Chin are part of what's called the Shan area of um, Myanmar. And the Shan are um, quite picked on and discriminated against by um, the Burmese. And that's caused a lot of problems. And I have to say, I wasn't aware of those conflicts when I was there and it wasn't evident, um, but it, it did give me cause to think um, about interacting with people who are under such distress from their government. Okay. So um, we went to three Chin villages over the course of a day, and I haven't separated out the villages because it doesn't really matter. The importance of the Chin villages are to see uh, these spaces. So they have these um, tattoos put on their faces when they're quite young, and they even have their eyelids. Um, can't really see the inner the lower part of her eyelid, but all the parts of her face have been tattooed and they were tattooed as young girls. And um, this practice is no longer done. And so, so I was there in 2016 and I think they said women who were over 50 were more likely to have it done and women under 50 were more likely not to have had it done. So that was about where the split came in. Um, and the, the mythology around it, the story around this is that the tattooing was done um, because other tribes would steal these women. And um, so the elders of this tribe convinced these women that these tattoos were really beautiful, which they do think that they were beautiful, but these other tribes would no longer steal them because uh, these women away because now they would be marked. This is, um, her granddaughter, 
And um, and you can see the difference in the face. So she's she's got a nice design on her face and it's that yellow sunscreen kind of thing. Um, but that's the difference um, in age there. Another woman um, and, and her face. Um, this is a woman and we'll come back. So what she's doing is splitting bamboo um, into pieces. And what they do is they weave the bamboo into things. And I'll show you a little bit about that, but I just wanted to capture that to give you a sense. Um, of where that was going. Um, here's a woman, um, same woman we saw just a moment ago. So she's weaving uh, scarves and blankets. Well, she's only weaving one thing, but she's weaving a blanket, but they weave scarves and blankets, very um, colorful ones. And so that's just the loom there. Uh, this was for the women, I call it um, the girlfriend shot. And um, they were just kind of fun and hanging out. A lot of them do smoke these pipes. Um, and I'm not sure exactly what they're smoking, but it's, um, I mean, it does have a, a drug effect on it. It's not tobacco. Um, this, just to give you an image of what some of the homes there looked again, you can get a sense that the weather isn't brutal um, because the homes are really uh, quite open um, there. Oh, let me go back once. So I was mentioning the weaving. So this is some of what the split bamboo is used for is, is to weave these multiple walls and, and things like that. Um, this was a different of the Chin villages. Um, and in this particular village, um, they, they were known for these colorful we woven scars. And these villages, a couple of these villages were used to tourists. So they were set up to um, try to sell us different things, particularly um, these scarves. And, and that was how they got money for their villages, basically. Okay, um, this is just us going down the river again to another village and people are waving at us, um, all very friendly because um, we look kind of unusual for sure. Um, this uh, little village that we stopped in, so these cows have those things on their mouths and what they're doing is grinding hay. So um, that's how the hay gets grinded there. And I thought that was really kind of interesting. So they put the animals to work um, to do that. Um, here, these women are sifting rice. And so the um, thick parts don't go through the holes in there and then they um, discard them to another pile. And it was really fascinating um, and beautiful to watch as you can imagine this uh, streaming um, stuff coming down. Okay, this was the final Chin, whoops, sorry. This was the final Chin village that we went to. And I, I mostly I put this in to remind myself that this was the last village. This village did not, does not really receive visitors, um, but it was arranged for us to be able to go there. And, and so one of the marks of that village was that they had nothing to sell us. For each of these villages, we did stop um, in the mornings and we bought blankets, we bought children's clothes, we bought medicine, we bought tissues, we bought uh, women's products um, and a variety of things. So we gave um, these villages a, a lot of things that they were really quite inexpensive to do it. So um, that was kind of our gift to them for allowing us to see their villages, village. Um, so here's a, a woman in this village, um, another Chin woman um, with her face marked. And she's weaving a mat. And so um, I just kind of am showing you this to give you a sense of that she's sitting on the mat and weaving it at that particular moment, she's looking at me. This is one of my favorite photos in, my, in the whole world. Um, this, uh, in this village that doesn't get visited, this was um, the elder of the village, a nun. Um, and she, so this was 2016, she was 101. And as of uh, last year, I don't know about this year, but as of last year, she was still alive. Um, and in fact, um, I was told that she was actually, in fact, I saw photos of her. She looked a lot healthier um, two years ago than she did here, but she just sat there calmly and she let us um, take her photos, uh, her photo. And she was just so nice about it. Um, this is the next village. Um, that we went to, and um, it's in um, Sitway. And so we had to take a boat down the river. Um, it lasted four and a half hours to get that boat ride. And we had lunch on the boat and then we landed in this village. And I just wanted to give you a sense of the village. It was raining that day, it was raining pretty hard. 
Um, and we had to climb up this really muddy path um, and, and it really wasn't pleasant. And so imagine the people living there. And so in this village, um, the, the tribe is called the Palan tri tribe. Um, and then there are parts of the tribe. And so what's unusual about this particular tribe is uh, they're known for this black teeth. Um, th these black teeth. Uh, and so they chew a lot of betel leaf um, and that turns their um, teeth black. And so um, that's their distinguishing feature. And so again, we um, wandered around uh, in the little, in the village and chatted with the women and took photos of them. And um, they showed us some of their goods and, and just were really kind and nice. Um, but it was really, it was cold and rainy that day. It wasn't very fun. Um, this was the next village, um, which is, sorry, um, Lokha, um, and then we, so to get to Lokha, that took us, um, again, that took us about 10 hours um, to get to that village. We um, got there um, and stayed for the day. And this was the Ki tribes. And what they're known for are these long necklaces or copper things um, on their necks, which are meant to extend their necks. Um, and so these are just two photos of those. The younger women, um, the young women in these villages do not follow this practice. They do not agree with this practice. They think it's um, a curse of the dragon to um, wear these, um, but the older women um, do very much appreciate them. This was a shaman in the village and he um, prayed over us. Um, mostly, as you can see, we were looking at women, um, but the shaman came out to, to bless us. This was um, yet another tribe um, and they're I can't think of their name right there. I think they're called the Ank, A-N-K-H. And what they're known for is the elongated earlobes. Um, and there weren't a lot of women in this particular village that we stopped in, um, but they were uh, willing to pose for us and to chat with us a bit. And so we did. Okay, and a few more photos to go a little faster. Um, so this is Inlay Lake, um, which is always on the highlights of Myanmar kind of trips. Um, and it's a long lake and lots of different little shops. There are silk shops and weaving shops and um, a variety of other things. These are kind of houses on the lakes and they're on stilts. It's, it's really quite beautiful and fascinating and calm to go along these lakes. This was a paper factory that we went into um, and this was a number of paper umbrellas that had been stacked up and lined up and I just thought they were really beautiful. Um, this, um, these were two women, they were making um, paper with flowers in them that then become screens um, that, you, that you can put in between rooms or something. And so they were kind of showing us a little bit about how those got made. Um, this is on Inlay Lake. This is a, I mean, I took this photo, but it's a classic photo. But the funniest thing about this photo was I was on, I was in a boat I was, and I um, was looking um, at this photo and I snapped the photo and the next thing that happened was our boat crashed into this guy. I didn't even see that happening. Um, I don't know what our driver was doing. Um, the guy was, the, this um, guy was not hurt, but um, we did crash into him for some unknown reason. And because I'm taking a photograph, I can't tell you why we crashed into him. Uh, another classic um, photo on in the lake, uh, the fishermen on one leg uh, with their nets. Um, and so you see lots of these photos. This is, um, can't, what's my notes here? Um, this is coming away from Inlay Lake. This is a very famous um, temple. And, um, and you see the, these photos like this a lot. This particular day, um, all the little monks uh, were looking out the window while we were there. And so um, we took a photo of them. And then these last few photos were in the Yangon train station. Um, and a guy took two of us to the Yangon train station, and this was really uh, interesting to me. And so I just captured a few shots of people getting ready to go off on trips. And I, what I was trying to do was capture what it feels like when you're anticipating going on a trip. So this woman was sitting 
Um, and she was just sitting on the floor smoking a cigarette. We probably were with her for about 30 minutes and she just smoked her cigar and we took photos of her and she tied it with our guide. Um, and then we bought her um, treats and some more cigars so that she could take them on her train ride. Uh, these were people, a couple waiting uh, for their uh, train to set off. And so they were just watching and you can kind of see the anticipation. Um, this is a little boy. Again, you can see his anticipation. And then uh, this two guys um, on the train, again, um, just contemplating um, going on their trip. And then, um, so these are all photos that I really quite like. Um, and then this was a guy sitting, not on, it was in the train station, but he was sitting outside on the platform and just uh, biding his time until the train came. So um, that's my little highlights of Burma, Myanmar. The end, stop sharing. Thank you very much, uh, Nancy. And thank you. I'll just put this on uh, a different view. View gallery. Now we can see everyone. There's a, a fascinating uh, set of trips that you did and uh, beautiful, beautiful photographs, especially the photographs of the people. So thank you for sharing. I'm not sure that I'd want to go on that uh, Wild West type of trip that you did, but the rest of it sounded pretty good. Are there any questions from the audience? You could unmute yourselves now and uh, ask your question. Did you come across any Rohingya uh, people when you were there? We did. Um, they, they were in one of the villages, but I'm trying to remember um, which one, but th that's really all I could tell you. We weren't focused on them. There's so many different tribes, so many um, differences in that country. It, it's kind of amazing, really. The you talked about, were, I'm sorry. sorry. So Carolyn asked you a question. Yeah, I, you looked at that, uh, that switchback uh, going up the mountain and talked about car sickness. I mean, the first thing that occurred to me was just terror. I mean, I, didn't, I wouldn't have wanted to do that at all. So, I mean, how did, didn't you feel frightened? Yeah, that's a good question, but um, I have been in situations where the fright overcame, not, I'm not talking about this, but just to give you a sense. I have been in situations where the fright overcame the car sickness, and I've been in situations where the car sickness overcame the fright. So it really varies. But we were in a pretty safe vehicle. Um, the, the road was wide enough and we weren't passing much traffic. So um, in that sense, it didn't feel dangerous and it wasn't raining. If it was raining, I might have had more doubt. Mm -hmm. Are there any of the viewers here who have been to Myanmar? No, I have I have somebody from Yangon who lives across the street from me, but she I think she has never seen any of these parts of her country. You know, <laughs> I was there in 2016 as well. Mm. Would you like to comment at all, Marilyn, about? Uh... No, it, it just brought back memories of the scenes. I'm looking at my own pictures on my desktop right now and it's, it's it's interesting to see how many of them correspond right. especially uh, things like uh, Lake Inley yeah, uh, I've been there too sorry and uh, we've been twice in Sitwe and uh, Miaku and uh, in the first time uh, Sitwe was full of uh, of Ohinia. the second time it no no Ohinia were there at all so there was kind of in between uh, all these things that we've heard about uh, and happened. I mean, they, they they were moved, they were kicked out of the country by the by the army in between these two years. I mean, you could you could easily uh, uh, identify them. They they really are from a different people. I believe that their origin the origin are from uh, Bangladesh, and and their features uh, are very different from from other tribes in the, in the, 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 that that comprise uh, Burma. Certainly the tribes that we visited are in some danger, particularly with the way that the country is right now. 
um, which is unfortunate um, that there are those distinctions and, and those issues. But I mean, we, we don't face anything quite like that here in the US. But, um, it's still, um, it, they're cut off in lots of ways. Ellen? Nancy, were you able to eat all the food that you were given? Um, <laughs> okay, so for the most part, I um, was able to eat the food that was given um, because uh, in the villages that we visited, uh, we weren't given much food and more of it was like bread and crackers and things, which tend to be relatively safe. But I did, uh, when we were in Sipway, um, two of us came down with horrible food poisoning. Um, mm -hmm. And so the, the tribe that our group went to, I couldn't go on that trip. I had to stay in my room all day um, because I was so sick. Um, but that happened at a restaurant and we'd eaten at that restaurant. It was the only restaurant in town. It was, um, there's not, there's like one hotel and one restaurant. And um, the third night, the first two nights, the food was great. Everybody did fine. The third night, um, I got sick and they later tried to figure out why I got sick and nobody else did. And it turned out that they, we'd ordered shrimp and a bunch of other things. They were eating meat and I, I eat shrimp, but I, oh, I eat fish and I don't eat meat. And um, the shrimp must have been contaminated because there was one other person who got a bit sick um, but she had only eaten one piece of shrimp. So that's kind of how we narrowed it down to that. But I, that had been kind of my meal. And oh my God, I was sick. But it worked out because we didn't, we weren't, I didn't have to do anything in the morning. So I could just rest. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, again, Nancy, I would like to thank you for a wonderful presentation. It's a first presentation of 2023. Um, 